Well, good afternoon. <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Happy Sabbath. <clears throat> Just over here. Welcome to all the guests here. It's nice to see such a full hall today. <clears throat> well, brethren, uh, Passover is now just about 12 weeks away, so that's uh, 12 weeks seems like maybe a little bit of a long time, but it probably will go by very quickly. And I wanted to give a message today that would sort of tie into a uh, spring Holy Day theme. I'm going to go ahead and give you the title of this, of this message right up front. <clears throat> the title is The Doctrine of Baptism. The Doctrine of Baptism. It's good from time to time to review our fundamental doctrines, and I appreciate Mr. Housen's sermon, uh, doctrinal sermon on the Sabbath. Um, good things to remind ourselves of from time to time and from season to season, <clears throat> just exactly what we believe and why we do what we do. The word doctrine itself actually means instruction, teaching, or learning. And baptism is a fundal, fundamental doctrine of the Bible, it is an ordinance that's commanded by God. Baptism is deeply meaningful and profound in its symbolism. It's vital for Christians to understand the basic doctrine of baptism. The United Church of God published this booklet, The Fundamental Beliefs of the United Church of God. Many of you probably have this and have read it uh, many times. Um, I'm gonna, it actually lists several doctrines, about 20 of them, and each section begins with a, a short sentence or two that describes really just kind of a very succinct, what do we believe, what does the church teach about that, and then it goes on uh, after that to give more detail. Um, but I'd like to go ahead and read the, just, just two sentences here that, on this introduction, of this short statement. It says, <clears throat> under a section of water baptism, we believe in the ordinance of baptism by immersion, after repentance, through the laying on of hands, with prayer, the believer receives the Holy Spirit and becomes a part of the spiritual body of Jesus Christ. That's two sentences, but packs a lot of meaning into those two sentences. And what I would like to do in the time that I have today is to go to some of the core scriptures that flesh out why, that support that, that belief statement. Um, why do we do baptism? What is it? Uh, where did we get it from, and, and why does the church have this doctrine? <clears throat> so let's go ahead and start our exploration of this doctrine. If you would open your Bibles to Matthew chapter three, we're gonna. I'm gonna turn to a lot of scriptures today, so uh, please get your fingertips ready to to turn pages. But you could. We're gonna come back to Matthew three a few times. So if you want to put a marker there, we're gonna jump around a little bit. But in Matthew chapter 3, we read about John the Baptist, uh, beginning in verse 1. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So John was out there preaching a message of repentance. He fulfilled this prophecy of Isaiah. He was preparing the way for the Messiah. Verse four, now John himself was clothed in camel's hair level with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Verse five, then Jerusalem, all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So here we see this introduction here to baptism, John the Baptist out there preaching, uh, living a, a maybe a strange life, uh, clothed the way he was and out there in the wilderness, but his message was getting across. People were hearing his message and coming out to him and confessing and being baptized. Let's uh, read if you would, keep your place in Matthew 3, but if you'll hop over to Mark chapter 1, it just adds slightly more detail. Mark chapter 1 and verses 4 and 5. <clears throat> says, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. So here we see John the Baptist was preaching a message, a message about baptism, about this need to be washed to be forgiven, to be cleansed, to have sins cleansed and forgiven, to repent of those sins. John was teaching the people 
that they needed to be baptized for that forgiveness of sin. And many were hearing his message and coming out to him <clears throat> and being baptized. Turn over to John chapter one, if you would. John chapter one and verse 29. The gospel of John chapter one, verse 29. <clears throat> it says the next day, so this is sometime later, but uh, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, so John was <clears throat> explaining that he was preaching about Jesus Christ, verse 30. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me, meaning he existed before me. Verse 31, I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. John says he was baptizing with water in order to prepare the people for Jesus Christ. Uh, let's continue on, verse, uh, read to verse 34. And John bore witness saying, <clears throat> I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said, and, said to me, upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So John was pointing to Jesus Christ. He was bearing witness that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, teaching the people that they needed to be baptized, to be washed, to be cleansed, and repent of their sins. <clears throat> Turning back to Matthew chapter 3, um, on introducing baptism here in the Bible. Well, we see that Jesus was, was baptized. We'll read that in John chapter three and verse 13. <clears throat> and Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John, John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, permit it to be so now, for thus is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. So we see Jesus Christ went out to John and went through baptism, allowed John to baptize him, not that he sinned or needed to be forgiven of sin. Christ was doing this as an example that he expects his followers to do also. So it was fitting and right for Christ, for Jesus to be baptized by John. <clears throat> Again, let's turn uh, to Matthew chapter 28. If you'll jump back to Matthew chapter 28. We'll read another scripture about baptism. <clears throat> Matthew 28 and verse 19, this is Christ giving his commission to his apostles, <clears> or <throat> disciples. And Jesus came out and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we're, Jesus commanded that his followers be baptized, that his uh, disciples would go out and be baptizing those that were being called, and that that was an important part of what they were to do. So, could just anyone be baptized? What was the requirement? <clears throat> Notice there that Jesus said, go out and baptize the disciples. Go out and make disciples of people and baptize them. Remember this memory verse, you don't have to turn to it. John 6, 44, many of you probably have that memorized where it says that no one can come to me, Christ speaking, <clears throat> no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. That process has to start with God the Father calling somebody and drawing them to himself. It's by invitation. It's a very unique, very special calling to be invited into that relationship with God that leads to baptism, repentance, and conversion. Notice, if you'll turn back to Matthew chapter three, notice what John said to the Pharisees in John chapter three and verse seven. So they saw that many of the people were going out and hearing the preaching of John and being baptized. In verse seven it says, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance 
And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down <clears throat> and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So he's, he gives the Pharisees a strong warning. You know, this isn't some light thing we're doing out here. You have to repent. You have to be willing to change. You have to live a new life. You have to recognize your sin. And there's a warning, strong rebuke and strong warning to those who, who don't understand what, what was going on. <clears throat> so we see John warning them that they must repent. And John was teaching them about how to, what true baptism was about. The water baptism that he was preaching was for that remission of sin. So we see then that baptism requires that someone have faith and repent. They have to believe in the message and then they have to do something. They have to change. They have to desire to be cleansed and to change their way. Uh, turn with you, if you would, over to Mark chapter 16. <clears throat> Mark 16. And verse 16. Mark 16 and verse 16 says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Belief is crucial. Belief, faith, the knowledge and understanding, belief in Jesus Christ and his, who he was and his sacrifice for us is, is pivotal, is, is crucial to being baptized, to being uh, partaking of that ceremony. Uh, turn with you also, if you would, to Acts chapter 2. So we see where belief is certainly required. And in Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> after hearing Peter's sermon, many were convinced and convicted in their heart and cut to the heart. And in verse <clears throat> 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? These are people who heard the message and believed. And in verse 38, then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So repentance has to be present. Belief and repentance come first. We must acknowledge and confess our guilt to God we must repent of our sins and believe in Christ and his sacrifice for us. And then we must begin to live a new life. We must be willing to change, to stop sinning and start doing what is right. So just to recap what we've gone over, I know we skipped through a lot of scriptures here to, to bring out some, some teaching about baptism. We've seen how John <coughs> paved the way, <coughs> started this baptism of, of water baptism. Um, preaching a baptism of repentance and remission of sins. He was preparing the way for Jesus Christ. You know, he was doing water baptism, but he, he was not, as he said, he's pointing to Christ. Christ is gonna baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You're gonna receive the Holy Spirit once Christ, after Christ's mission was completed. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. <clears throat> and then Jesus, we saw him being baptized as an example. And then we saw where Jesus commanded his followers to be baptized. He commanded them to go out and make disciples. <clears throat> so we see a baptism also must be preceded by faith and repentance. So it's an introduction, some of the core scriptures that we understand and know and teach about where the concept of baptism is in the Bible. <clears throat> now let's consider the method of baptism. <clears throat> How is it done? The word baptize uh, in the Greek is baptizo, and it means to immerse. So the word there itself means immersion or complete covering <clears throat> in water or whatever you're immersing it in. Uh, if you're still in Matthew chapter three, if you could turn back there again, we, we read this verse, but I'm just gonna emphasize it again. In Matthew three and verse five, it said, <clears throat> then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan. 
confessing their sins. They went down into the river. They had to go out where he was near this body of water and they got down into the river to be baptized. Uh, more evidence of that, if you'll turn to John chapter three, you know, why we do full immersion, why we believe that that's the correct way <clears throat> is the example here in scripture, John chapter three, verse 22. John chapter three, <clears throat> verse 22 it says, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came to the land of Judea and there he remained with them and baptized. So we have Jesus was out doing baptizing and, and John as well. Verse 23, now John was also baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. So they chose this location. I looked in a Bible map where, this, where they think this location was and it was also near the Jordan River area. So they needed much water. Why did they need much water? Because they were doing a full immersion. They had to go down in the water and come back out. <clears throat> also, another example in Acts chapter 8. If you turn to Acts chapter 8, we see again where baptism requires full immersion. Acts chapter 8. Uh, this is Philip preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch in verse 35. <clears throat> then Philip opened his mouth and, beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So again, we see that faith component. Verse 38, So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. And he baptized him. And now when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. So they went, they went down in the water and came back up. It wasn't a sprinkling. It wasn't a splashing. It wasn't a small amount of water that required them to be pushed down under that water. So nowhere in the Bible do we see sprinkling as a method of baptism. And these three examples are evidence um, of that, that they required large, large bodies of water and that that's where they were doing baptisms. Um, also, just if you think about baptism, the concept of what, what is it picturing? You know, baptism is picturing a, a burial, a death and a burial. So the symbolism involved also would support full immersion because when we, we die, we're buried fully. And, and so just that very symbolism in itself would indicate a full water baptism, a full immersion. So, <clears throat> so we read about that. <clears throat> Next, baptism is also followed by, and this is very important, baptism is then followed by the laying on of hands, the laying on of hands to receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're already in chap chapter eight of Acts, if you'll go back to verses 14 through 18. <clears throat> Acts chapter eight, verses 14 to 18, says, now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet it had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 17, then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So there's this group of people in Samaria that got baptized, water baptism, for their remission of sins, but had not yet had hands laid on them to receive the Holy Spirit. So we see where Peter and John went to them uh, because they were elders and, and could do the laying on of hands and ask for that Holy Spirit to come to them and they were given the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Another crucial aspect of this belief that we have of baptism. When we then receive that Holy Spirit, that, that's where we really begin to, to change. And John was pointing to, you know, I'm baptizing you with water, but Christ is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You're going to receive the Holy Spirit later on. And, and he was pointing to that. And we, we do that now when we go through the baptism process and the laying on of hands. <clears throat> it's when we begin to start a new life. So once hands are laid on after baptism, the Holy Spirit is received, 
that's a crucial moment. That's the moment that a Christian, a believer, is now a part of the very family of God. They have God now dwelling in them, Christ living in them through that power of the Holy Spirit. It begins the process of a changed life. It's a, an incredible moment. Um, let's read Galatians chapter two. Uh, just one verse here, Galatians two and verse 20. It's just an incredible miracle, a credible change that takes place once the hands are laid on. <clears throat> I'm to find it here, one second. Galatians chapter two. Uh, Galatians chapter two and verse 20. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. What a, I was read this verse a few months ago and was just thinking about that. How incredible of a, a statement that is to say uh, and to actually have it be true. That's what happens. Christ's mind is now in the converted Christian. It's operating in you. Uh, what an incredible and profound statement that is. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. That's a totally changed life. That's a converted life. And it begins at that moment when we make that step to, to go through baptism and repentance and the laying on of hands for, for the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is the spiritual power to change and to be converted. It gives us spiritual understanding. The laying on of hands is a vital part of that process. We also read that, we read Acts chapter two, verses 37 and 38 earlier, where it talks about that gift. You know, repent and have hands laid on you so you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful promise. <clears throat> so, continuing on, the process of baptism and laying on of hands places a believer into the very body of Jesus Christ, the very body. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll read verses 12 to 14. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12 says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that body of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. So all these various people that God is calling starts with that miracle of call the call from God, they respond. They begin to see themselves. They begin to see their sin. They begin to see their error. They repent. They have faith. They get baptized. They have hands laid on. And now they're a part of the very, they have Christ dwelling in them. And now they're a part of a family, the very family of God, the very family of his church. Just an incredible thing to think about, an incredible thing to be a part of. <clears throat> So that's another aspect of this process that it does for us when we make that commitment. We become a member of the very body of Jesus Christ, made up of the very diverse and different people that he calls. <clears throat> another point is that baptism is only for those who are mature enough to grasp the level of commitment that they're making. We just talked about some very serious, very profound things it requires somebody to be mature, of, a, of a, a right age, to be able to understand the kind of commitment, the kind of, the kind of contract, the kind of thing that they're entering into with God. They have to understand that. Baptism is a serious commitment. It requires us to count the cost. Let's read that, if you would, in Luke chapter 14. <clears throat> in Luke chapter 14, uh, verse 25 through 33 says, now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. You know, we know that the word hate here means to love less by comparison. It means if you 
love your family or you love yourself or your own way or you love your brother or your, more than Christ, more than God, more than his way, you, you're not fit to be a disciple. We have to be able to make that commitment to put God first. And you have to be of a right age to do that. Continuing in verse 27, <clears throat> and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So we have to be willing to endure whatever we might face. We have to understand that we're making a commitment and that we're gonna through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. And we have to be able to count that cost. We have to be able to be willing and understand what we're doing. Verse 28, for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he's laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes out to him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. I have to be willing to give it all up, whatever in this life might get in the way. It, we can't let it get in the way. We have to count that cost, assess that, assess where we are, assess our relationship with God, and that's part of that calling process and part of the baptism counseling that, um, that the church does. I just know from going through it myself, but um, is, is part of that counting the cost. They'll ask you, have you, have you considered this? Have you considered, have you, do you understand the commitment you're making? Because they want to be sure <clears throat> that they're baptizing people who have done that, who have counted the cost. So, <clears throat> so it's, it requires a, an entire change of life. That's another reason why we wouldn't baptize a, a child or a small, small child. They don't understand any kind of commitment. They were not committing to a new way of life. If they're a young child, they don't understand that. Let's turn to Romans chapter six. And Mr. Hausen read uh, part of this verse earlier, but we'll, we'll go over a little bit. I'll read some other verses as well. <clears throat> Romans chapter six, verses uh, one through four. Verse one says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How can we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. It's a commitment to walk in a new way, to leave that old path, to quit going down that old road, and to carve out a new path with God, with his help, with his direction, to follow his path. It's a life-altering path, and so it can only be entered into by those who understand and have a mature mind that can grasp the meaning. Brethren, <clears throat> baptism is a deeply meaningful step in the conversion process. The act of baptism after faith and repentance is an outward showing of our faith, our belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's also symbolic of our willingness and commitment to put to death that old man, to put to death that old person, man or woman, whoever you were before your baptism, you committed, if you were baptized, to putting that person to death, to walk in a new way of life. It also reminds us the process of baptism, this watery burial and coming back up and walking in a new life. It also points to and reminds us of a future hope in a future resurrection, just as Christ was resurrected from the dead and we have faith in that resurrection, we then believe we also will be resurrected. Romans, <clears throat> we're already in Romans chapter six, uh, let's read verses five through 11. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. 
knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him and that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, <clears throat> having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. So we have a hope of a future resurrection that just like Christ died, we symbolically died through baptism. We were willing to put that life to death and hopes of and belief in a future life and resurrection. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 2, if you would. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2, we'll read verses 11 through 13. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2 says, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. And so he's talking about not circumcision of the flesh, but of the heart. You know, when we're baptized and converted and received the Holy Spirit, we're cut to the heart. Our heart begins to change by God's Spirit. <clears throat> Uh, continuing on here, by putting off the body and the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Verse 12, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together, together with him, having given you, having forgiven you all your trespasses having forgiven you all your trespasses. You have now a new life symbolized by this baptism, this process where you repent and God wipes away the penalty for your sin and now you walk in a new way of life. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter four. If you turn over to Ephesians. Ephesians 4, we'll read uh, verses 17, starting verse 17. <clears throat> this is about the new man. <clears throat> Ephesians 4 and verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, and being alienated from the life of God. That's, <clears throat> that's the condition of, of the world, of the carnal man before God begins that process, before the call and the invitation. Continuing on, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness in their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all in cleanliness with greediness. Verse 20, but you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have seen him, uh, <clears throat> been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus that you put off Concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. That creation process, God's conversion process is a process of creation. He's creating a new being. The old being died. And now the new being lives. It lives a life that's pleasing to God. It lives a life that is like God, striving to become perfect and eventually becoming God and becoming part of the very family of God, born into his family. It's an incredible miracle. It's an incredible blessing. It's an incredible doctrine. It's an incredible truth. And so it's good from time to time uh, to review these things. So brethren, as we... <clears throat> In closing here, as we get close to another Passover season, it is good to be reminded of the commitment that we made to God at our baptism. Whether that was many, many years ago, or maybe even recently, we should always be striving to live up to our commitment 
to continue to repent and to walk with God and keep working towards the end goal of perfection to be just like God the Father and our elder brother, Jesus Christ.